Hello, so my name is Maureen. I'm actually an um, engineer in the Search Quality Group, and um, so I'm introducing Professor Vincent Blondel from uh, the Université Catholique um, de Louvain in Belgium. Um, so he's a professor of applied mathematics at uh, UCL, and he's also the head of uh, the Department of Mathematical Engineer, Engineering over there. And he was my uh, thesis advisor when I was an undergrad student um, in Belgium. Um, he's also currently doing a sabbatical year at MIT. And um, today's talk is going to be about um, a concept, a new concept of uh, similarity measure between nodes in graph. And he's going to talk about different applications such as the, um, the web graph, but also uh, some telecommunication networks and also um, synonym generation from um, graph of synonyms. Can you hear me? Do I need a microphone? Can you hear me in the yeah, map? Yes, you will. Good try. Good try. <laughs> uh -huh. OK. Very well. So thank you. I'm very happy to be here for, uh, for, for, for this talk. Uh, I, I'm, I apologize for the rescheduling of the, of the talk. I initially planned at uh, this morning at 11, and uh, my flight from Boston yesterday was canceled, and so I arrived only this morning. And uh, I'm very happy to be here, even though the, it's raining. The temperature in Boston when I left it was about zero degree when I left, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have a, an increase in temperature. So as, uh, as Maureen said, I'm going to talk about similarity in graphs and networks, and let me directly illustrate what type of tools I'd like to, uh, uh, to present. And the, the, the tool I'm going to present is appeared in a, in a, in a paper uh, which has uh, Maureen as a, as a, as a co-author in Siam Review uh, two years ago. So the tool I want to describe is a way of uh, uh, expressing how similar nodes are in graph. And here is a very little example. You have a, a first graph, graph A, here, and you have another graph, B, here. And then from these two graphs, we construct a matrix that expresses how similar the, these nodes, the, the nodes in the respective graphs are. Okay, so uh, the, the matrix has as many columns as there are nodes here, and as many rows as there are nodes here. And if you look at the entries of the matrix, these entries are attempt at characterizing how similar nodes are in these respective graphs. So for example, so this is what I, I, we intend to do in this similarity matrix. And so for example, if you take node four here and node five here, so you take the fourth, fourth column and the fifth row, you get a zero, which means essentially that this node here doesn't at all look like this node here. If you look at the largest entry in this, this matrix, the largest entry is in here, and this entry corresponds to node three here and node four there. And so this, this entry says that uh, indeed node three in the, the graph B looks very much like a node four in graph A. Okay, so what I'm going to do during this talk here is uh, to explain how we can uh, derive this similarity matrix. I'm sorry, this, this microphone is, is just going on and off. Is that, can I, can I should I keep using the microphone or? Oh, it's, do, can you hear me well with the microphone? Okay, very well, I'll continue with the microphone then, okay. So what I'm going to do during the talk is uh, 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 describing the way we construct this matrix. And the matrix is very inexpensive to compute. It's very cheap to compute, and so it can be computed on very large graphs. I haven't represented here very large graphs, but it can be uh, constructed for uh, graphs that have millions or, or, or more nodes. And typically, uh, one has well, one, one possible application is a situation where we have one little graph that expresses some structure that we'd like to extract from the large graph. Okay? But other potential applications are are when both graphs are equal, in which case what we do is essentially uh, characterizing how similar nodes in the same graphs are. Okay, So we just then have one graph and we try to express how similar uh, nodes are in these graphs. So here is another uh, illustration of, of the matrix. You can, of course, choose one particular node in, in, uh, in the first or the second graph, which corresponds to picking either a row or a column, and then ask which node is most similar in the other graph. So for example, here, if we choose the, uh, node four, it means that we choose the fourth line, and in the fourth line, you're asking which, which is the entry that is large, which is the largest entry? This is the largest entry. It corresponds to column three, which means that the, the, the node 
node here that is, that is most similar to this one here is node three, okay? So uh, it's a, it's a, this, this similarity matrix is a useful way of characterizing similarities between nodes in graphs. And as I said, uh, it's, uh, it's easy, I'll describe it during this talk, it's easy and inexpensive to compute. The cost is linear in the number of edges, so you may have very large graphs. And it can extend to a situation where we not only have graphs, but we have networks. So typically we have weights on the arcs. So if, if this corresponds to a website and there's another one, maybe uh, the, we have a weight on the arc that, that, that tells how many links there are. And if this is a cellular phone communication network, then probably this says how, many, how often uh, this, this person here has called this other person there and so on. So it extends to the situation of uh, weighted graphs. So what I'm going to do in the talk is that I'll first uh, describe how we came to that definition which we came to uh, by uh, extending a notion uh, that was introduced by John Kleinberg from, uh, from John Kleinberg from Cornell, uh, which is the HITS method, HITS method, which I believe that most of you know, uh, for, for searching the web, which is a way, an alternative way to the, to the, to the page rank computation. And then I'll describe how to extend this notion of HITS to the, uh, computing similarity in graph networks, and then I'll go to a, a few applications. And as Maureen said, one of the applications will be automatic synonym extraction of, of uh, monolingual dictionaries. And I'll describe some experiments we did on a, on a dictionary. Okay, so the, the, the method of Kleinberg, of Kleinberg, as you can see by, this is a proof, not a mathematical proof, this is not a proof by simulation, it's a proof by, by Google Scholar that it has attracted a, a, a lot of attention in the scientific community. Yes? Back up to the very beginning, what is the motivation for considering that there'd be any similarity between a node in graph B and a node in graph A? They have nothing to do with each other, apparently, other than they're both round and they both are labeled with the same numbers. Yes, so, but wouldn't you agree that, that this node here probably looks a little more like this one rather than this one here, right? So, what characteristics are you judging similarity then? Okay, so then, then what you're asking, I suppose, is what notion of similarity do you want to express in the, in, the, in, the mat in the similarity matrix? Is that your question or what type of similarity? Okay, so there, there are many different ways of defining similarity. And this, this one here, uh, contrary to the usual definition of similarity, usually si similarity is defined in, uh, typically in terms of the number of paths or weighted sum of number of paths that are between two nodes. And two nodes are said to be similar if, if they are sort of close to each other or if the, the number of paths, are, whereas here the notion we, we, we capture with the similarity matrix is completely different from there in the sense that the, the, two, uh, the two graph may be, the two nodes may be completely uh, disconnected and even though have a high degree of similarity. And this, the notion of similarity we, we, we capture is the one of the, the sort of the, the structured position of the node within the graph. So uh, th this node here has a structured position within the graph that is somewhat analogous to the, the structured position of this node in, the, in, in this other graph. And so that's the notion of w that we capture. So the notion is, is really not a measure of the uh, weighted sum, or which, which are the usual notion of similarity in graphs, so a weighted sum of, of, of the number of paths, but, but the notion of the, the uh, the, the, the structural position of the node within the graph. So for example, if we look at uh, communities, uh, uh, typically, uh, and we have two gra different graphs that represent communities, uh, perhaps that if we, if we identify nodes that are similar in the two graphs, these nodes will represent people that have similar uh, uh, interconnection to other people. Okay, so although they are not related at all to each other, because they have no links, but they, 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 they play the same role within their community. So that's the notion we want to express. Yes? You say that the, the computing is linear in the number of edges. Yes. The output itself, if it's the similarity matrix, can be larger than the number of edges, the input graph. It can be the, the quadratic. Well, yes. The, 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 well, OK, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't have phrased it this, this way. What I mean is that once you choose, uh, typically I choose a graph here, which is a small graph, because I I'd like to extract from a large graph, I'd like to, uh, to extract features of, of that large graph uh, that, that I expressed in the small graph that I have here. 
and then and then this computation is is the number of edges I have in the large graph. Okay, but you're right. So if in in full generality, if in particular if we have the same graph here and the graph there, then this is a n square, and we need at least n square operation. Yes. Is there a precise definition of similarity in terms of mathematical? Okay. Formula? Yes. So I'll come I'll come I'll give the precise formula for this similarity matrix. Okay. So it's not like, uh, I understand some of your questions, so it's not like we had an idea of what similarity we want to express and then we com came up with a formula. So it's the other way around. So uh, we extended this notion of Kleinberg and then we looked at what type of, of similarity it, it expresses. Okay, but I'll give a very precise formula for this. Okay, so m let me uh, come to a, first a, a, a quick description of Kleinberg's method since our method is an extension of Kleinberg's method, so I'm, let me first describe Kleinberg's method. So the, the idea of Kleinberg was to assign to websites, to web pages, uh, a, a measure of whether the web page is a good authority or whether it's a good hub. So if, if you type in a search word like University Belgium, then these pages would be good authorities because these are the home pages of different universities in Belgium. Okay, so these pages will have a, a very high authority uh, uh, score. Whereas uh, this page here has a number of links to other Belgian universities, and so this page here will be perceived as a good hub. Okay, so the idea of Kleinberg was simply to assign to every page a score that is, that is its hub score and a score that is a hub authority score. Okay, so every page has two scores, not just one, not just a page rank, but it has two scores, a hub score and an authority score. Now, when are you a good hub? You are a good hub if you're pointing to good authorities. And when are you a good authority? You are a good authority, you have a good authority score if pages that have good hub scores are pointing to you. Okay, so it's just a circling definition. And he expressed the circling definition in, in, this, in this formalism here. So every page is given an authority score and a hub score. And web pages with high authority scores, uh, if they are pointed by a page that have a high hub score, and the other way around. Okay, so how do you, how do you start and how do you, how do you uh, pass the way that, that uh, this is a circling definition? Well, one way of doing this is to just assign the same hub scores and authority scores to all page at the start, and then start iterating this, this little linear update. So the linear update does what? Well, the hub score of page J, the hub score of page J, gets the sum of the authority scores of the pages J is pointing to. And then just the, the, the opposite for uh, authority score, the authority score, authority score of page J is just the sum of the hub scores of uh, the, po the, the pages that are pointing to J, okay? And so we start with uh, an initial assignment of these hub and authority score, and then we iterate this. Uh, of course, this will explode with time because if, if we give an initial assignment of one, this will just increase, but then at every step, we just rescale these two vectors, okay? And if we do this, uh, then what one, can, what one can prove is that independently on what you started from in terms of initial score, this process always converges. And it converges to the same value in the, that is independent from the, the initial assignments of the hub and authority scores. And it corresponds, these two values, these two vectors of hub scores and authority scores correspond to the, to the eigenvector, the dominant eigenvector of, uh, or the dominant, uh, uh, eigen, uh, is dominant eigenvector of a matrix that is computed by just taking the adjacency matrix of the graph multiplied by its transpose. And the other one is the dominant eigenvector of the transpose multiplied by the matrix. So these are the singular vector of, of the adjacency matrix of the graph, okay? So it's a very natural, and this, this is essentially the power method for computing eigenvectors. Okay, which is, which is a, of course, a, a well-known way of, of approximating an event of linear transformations. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is to think, and that's just the, that's just the innovation, I'd like to think of uh, these hub scores and authority scores in some sense. What we want to express here is to assign scores, two scores to every web page, and these two scores correspond to a similarity to the hub or a similarity to authority. And what I'm going to do next, and so Kleinberg methods express similarity between nodes in a graph 
with this node in this little graph and this node in this little graph. And what I'm going to do is just extend this ID and have here a graph that is more general than just the hub authority graph. Okay, a very, a very natural thing to do. Let me do it just for a simple graph, a very simple graph with three nodes. So it's the first, the simplest extension of, of this ID. So assume that we now have beginning, a begin node, a center node, and an end node. And we have this little graph here. And now I start again with my large graph, and to all nodes in my large graph, I'll now associate three values. Not just two, have an authority, but three values. And these three values will correspond to whether the corresponding node is similar to a beginning node in this graph, a center node in this graph, or an end node in that graph, okay? So this is a very simple ID. We just have now a three-node graph, and we compute similarity to this three-node graph. So how do we do the update? Well, am I, uh, what is my score? What is my beginning score? I'm a good, I'm, I'm, I have my, big, my, my uh, beginning score of page J is high provided I'm pointing to pages that have a high C score. Okay, exactly as we did for Kleinberg, we do know something slightly more co complex, but uh, we update the value of J, the B value of J, the beginning score of page J, as the sum of the, uh, the center score of the pages I'm pointing to. And similarly for the end score, and then for the center score, we take, of course, the value both of these guys and of the, these guys there, okay? And then we update this transformation. It's again a linear transformation of the score. So if you, if you take B, C, and E, and, and you look at how they, uh, how they evolved after just one iteration, it's just a linear transformation. And so for sure, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with uh, uh, another type of eigenvalue problem. And indeed, what the quantity that we're going to converge to with these scores is again an eigenvector, but of a matrix that is now constructed from the initial uh, 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 GCC matrix of the graph, but in a slightly more complex way as the one we had for the, for the Kleinberg method, okay? So here's a little example uh, of, uh, of, of a graph of which we've computed, I've computed the similarity with, with this graph. And if you take, for example, the two node here, and you're looking in this graph and you're asking, which among all these nodes, which one is most similar to this node in this little graph? Well, it means corresponding to the corresponding column here. And what the method says is that this entry, the second and the third entries are those that are most similar, which means that the node two and the node three here are the two nodes that are most similar to the node two in this little graph, okay? And uh, we, we have, a, as we can prove as a property, which is analogous to the one we had for Kleinberg, that if you start from an GCC matrix of the graph, then the central score, which means, which by this I mean the, the score associated to this node, will be given by the dominant eigenvector of the matrix here, B, B transpose B plus B transpose B, where, uh, these, uh, where the B matrix is the GCC matrix of the graph there. So maybe I can just, uh, yes, and uh, uh, if, if I now denote this in a more compact way, I can use B, C, and E just to put them in, in, a, in a matrix form so, so as to construct the similarity matrix. And then one can see that if you look at these iterates and you look at how B, C, and E are being updated, Okay, then the question is, how is this matrix S, this similarity matrix S, how is this matrix being updated? Well, you can express the update of the matrix S in terms of the adjacency matrices of the large graph and of this little graph here. And now A is the adjacency matrix of the large graph and B is the GC matrix of this little graph here. And if you look at the updates, these are updates are linear and you can write them in matrix form in this way. So that what the method boils down to, and that's, that's the only equation you have to remember in order to compute the similarity matrix. This is not, of course, writing the matrices is not the most efficient way of doing it. You, never, you should never write these matrices explicitly. But what the computations correspond to is just making this update. We start from some matrix S, which can be taken, which can be taken an arbitrary matrix, and typically we take a matrix with ones everywhere, and then we update this linear transformation, and we converge exactly as with the power method for eigenvalues, for eigenvectors, dominant eigenvector. Here we obtain a dominant eigenmatrix, 
And this is uh, the S matrix is the eigen matrix corresponding to, to this linear transformation. Okay. Now, uh, the fact that we, we're using the, the GCC matrix, let me just uh, give a quick reminder that the GCC matrix of a graph, well, I'm sorry, is, is a matrix that has uh, uh, its rows and columns corresponding to nodes and has a zero and ones depending on whether there is a edge between the corresponding nodes. Okay, so this is a uh, just a small, this is a matrix for a small portion of the World Wide Web, about uh, 60,000 nodes. And as you can see, it's a highly structured, uh, it's a highly structured matrix, which clearly shows that, of course, these matrices should never be uh, uh, computed explicitly uh, because they have, uh, they have, uh, they for most of the entries, these entries are zero. But going through them, we can see the, the apparent structure of the interrelation between uh, between the nodes. Okay, so now uh, this is the updating equation and I've motivated this updating equation for the particular situation where we have the BCE graph. And so uh, the way this, this little graph appears in this formula is that it's one of the two GCC matrices appearing in this, in this update. But there is no reason to limit ourselves to just uh, uh, graphs of this type. And the same formula, exactly the same formula can be used for any type of graphs. And so this is the way of, one way of expressing similarity between, uh, between nodes in graphs. And that's the, the updating equation I've used in order to produce the, the similarity, similarity matrices that I've shown at the beginning, okay? So the algorithm for, for computing similarity is not very, very simple. We constructed the GC matrices of A and B. We start with a matrix that has ones everywhere. We update and we need to take the even in order to ensure, st that in, in ensure convergence, we need to take the even iterates. We compute the even normalized iterates in the sense that at, at after every step, we also no need to normalize the matrix divided by its norm. And then after convergence, we stop and we ob obtain the similarity matrix, which is, which is uh, uh, an eigen matrix associated to this link transformation. Okay, so here is again the example I've shown before. And as I said also at the beginning, you can of course apply uh, the, 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 the technique by using here and there the same graph, in which case you obtain a matrix that expresses similarity between nodes within the graph. So here's the similarity matrix one obtains by, by, by starting with this graph and having the same graph to which we compare it. And as you can see, the results are uh, rather convincing in the sense that what the method finds out is that these two nodes are, well, which is uh, of course the natural thing to do, which that these two nodes are similar to each other, but there is no similarity between the other nodes, which corresponds to the fact that we have uh, non-zero entries on the diagonal elements and, uh, uh, and the matrix there that express the similarity between three and four. Okay. So let me uh, briefly describe one first short application of this to the analysis that we did of uh, a cellular phone network. This is a, a contract we have with a, a, a mobile phone company in Belgium, one of the major mobile phone company in Belgium. They have recorded complete data for six months period in 2005. And so, of course, Belgium is not that a large company, so we have two million customers, but it's already, it's large by a Belgium scale. So we have two million phone numbers and they've, fo they've, they've, they've formed about 600, 600 uh, million phone calls. Uh, between these these uh, uh, these telephone numbers and what cellular phone companies are interested in are typically questions like whether uh, how the, how the graph looks like the, this graph or interconnection how does it look like are there people who are likely to move to some other mobile phone company uh, can I identify communities within that that network and uh, typically how will a, a new service or a new product spread in that community and if I want to spread the product in that community what should I do should I where, uh, who should I give the product to where where should I target the the advertisement and so forth so they'd like to have to do viral marketing okay so this is a, a distribution of calls received on this on this large graph as you can see some some of uh, these customers receive a very large number so this is the number of calls received number of customers on a log log plot and so uh, there there are there are some customers who uh, have received more than a thousand phone call but most of them here 
have uh, received just one. This is a very large number of customers who have just received just one. And you have this uh, distribution of uh, number of customers versus number of calls. And this is typically the type of graph you obtained in, in, uh, in scale-free network. For a scale-free network, you have a line and uh, uh, a straight line here, which means that you have, there is a, a power low distribution of these, these degrees. So this is a, just an attempt of verifying that indeed we have a, a, a scale-free a scale network as we expect in the case of uh, communication between, between cellular phone. Uh, and this is just a, a reminder that while well, the, the usual random network model for uh, modeling the communication between cell phone networks is, is inappropriate and it's, uh, it's more like a, a scale-free network and these other uh, type of networks also have this power low distribution of, uh, of degrees. Then uh, this is a representation of the, the graph we, uh, of, of communication between, between all these nodes. And so in order to produce this, since we have two million nodes, of course, we cannot even plot two million pixels on, on, on a computer screen. So we had to somehow uh, identify uh, leaders or main people in communities. And in order to do that, we, we used the, uh, the notion of a central score we had uh, presented just before in order to identify the, the, the person that we'd like to keep in order to make a representation uh, of the graph. So it looks like the graph is, is separated in two parts. And once, once uh, ha after having obtained this, so we went back to the mobile phone company and we asked whether they had data about the language, because you may know that in Belgium we speak both French and Flemish, and whether they had information about the language, and they gave us this information. And so it, it came out very nicely. As you can see, you have this is Walloon, so it's these, these here speak French, these ones speak Flemish, and then you have, a, well, the, the green ones are Brussels, because Brussels is sort of bilingual, it's in between uh, Flemish and and French, so it was a convincing argument that this, this representation of brass represents something. Okay, so uh, let me now describe another application, which is the one for uh, a automatic extraction of, of uh, synonyms in a dictionary, and this will be the last application I'll, I'll, I'll describe. So in the dictionary graph, we consider a situation where um, the nodes are the words in the dictionary, and there is an edge u to v if v appears in the definition of u. Okay, so we, we construct a large graph, and this was the Webster uh, dictionary that we took. And again, you can look at the in degree distribution of, of the words. So you have a you have a, 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 a some words have an in degree of a thousand or even uh, almost ten thousand, which means that they used in ten thousand definition. And so these are the words of, uh, the, and so forth that are used in, in, in many, uh, in many definition. And so again, we have a, a, a scale free network, which is the network we construct from that dictionary. So how to extract, uh, uh, automatically extract a synonym in that dictionary. So here's the method that we used and I'll then describe the result we obtained. So assume we, we'd like to find a, a synonym to likely. So we have likely, we first look at the neighborhood graph. So we look at all the nodes that are used in the definition of likely, and we used, we used all the words that use likely in their definition. So this defines a number of nodes, and we then look at the subgraph of the dictionary graph that correspond to these nodes. So we reconstruct the subgraph. So this is the subgraph reconstructed from likely. And this is a rather, well, we, we haven't represented all the words because there are more words here, but in order to, so this, this example to fit on the screen, we, we remove some of these. And if the graph is, is not large enough, then we may typically go one step more and look at the words that appear in the definition of the words that appear in the definition of the words. So we, we can take a diameter that is larger than we have here. And then once we've done this, we look at the similarity score uh, of the nodes that are present in this graph with the central node in this little graph, okay? So because of the way we've constructed this little graph, we've looked at all the nodes that we're pointing to and we've looked at all the nodes that are pointing to us. Now we expect the uh, nodes that have a high central score to be a good candidates for synonymy to or, to or likely, okay? And we use this to, uh, to rank automatically synonyms. So here's the, the result that we get. And this is just an example for the word disappear. 
And we have three different methods here that, that do automatic synonym extraction. And these two are uh, handmade uh, synonym extraction. These are di synonym dictionaries that have been handmade. And this is just a, the, the last bit line here is just a, uh, an estimate of how uh, well the, the ranking was uh, as evaluated by humans. Okay. So for disappear, the central method here is the one we've used. So this is the way, this is the situation where we compute the, the central score of all the nodes that appear in the neighborhood graph and we rank the nodes according to their central score. And as you see, as you can see, while we have reasonable uh, candidate for synonymy with, with, with our method, which, which clearly outperforms uh, the, the other vector method and the arc rank method, which is essentially uh, uh, it, which is a method that was proposed by researchers at Stanford and that is essentially an extension, well, an adaptation of the page rank uh, for, for the situation of extracting synonyms. Here's another word, science. And it's not quite clear what, what synonyms we could have for science. And again, as you can see, well, among the automatic extraction of synonyms, uh, the central score is performing reasonably well. It doesn't perform very well as compared to the to the words that have the, the, the synonyms that have been composed manually by humans. But uh, one drawback of, of our method is that it does not allow us to to use composed words, which 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 is allowed in in human made dictionary like knowledge domain, knowledge based, and field of study, which cannot be extracted from the central score in the way. I've described it here. Okay, so the, the last uh, word is uh, sugar. And uh, again, we're performing reasonably well as compared to the, to the other two methods. And as you can see, the, the handmade, the human-made uh, dictionary of Microsoft seems to focus on a, a particular uh, aspect of, of, of the word of the word through sugar. So we, we've had an exchange with Le Petit Robert, which is the French dictionary, and they are now considering implementing this method in their, uh, their CD-ROM version of, of their dictionary. OK, so that's about the conclusion of, of, of my talk. So I've uh, introduced a new notion of similarity, which is, as I said at the beginning, which has nothing to do with the number of paths between the, gra between the nodes in the graph, but which, is, which expresses a more structured property of nodes in graphs. And uh, this, this similarity matrix is very easy to compute. We just need to start with a matrix that has ones everywhere and then iterate this, this, uh, this updating equation, this normalized. We need to normalize, of course, but we compute normalized iteration of this equation. And so, uh, which clearly shows also that the method is inexpensive. And so we can it can be applied to a, to a very large graph and, and networks. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. How do you extend the notion of similarity to weighted graphs? Well, that's a good question. Well, th these are JCC matrices. They could as well have weights that correspond to the weights on the edges. Instead of ha having one, if you have more, have several links, you just have a value that represents this. And it could be fraction values also. So, yes. Yes? Um, since your computation, in the case of the three nodes, you compute the central score. Um, since you're essentially linear, you can get a good central score by either pointing to lots of end guys or coming from lots of beginning guys, and not both. Have you considered the nonlinear case where you essentially multiply the, those two things you sum together? Or instead of if it, in, yeah, instead of taking the sum, we could take the product. That's what you're, OK. So in the, in the central score, but the way we define the central score is by uh, so if I can go back, so what you're seeing is in these iterates here, we, we have a plus sign, we could have a product sign. Yeah, we could have a product sign or we could have this quantity to, a, well, any norm, of course, of these two, we could have a, some, some, power, uh, some power here plus some power there and, and all, types of, all these types of, uh, of updates are possible. The advantage of taking sums here is that we just then are in, in, in linear algebra and we can prove convergence and all that. But it may be more relevant for application, but probably more difficult to, pr to prove than convergence, but more relevant for application to have something that is more sophisticated than just a plus. Yes, a product, for example, or something else, yes. 
Schön. Und wir gehen weiter. Yes. You mentioned the word convergence. What is what determines the rate of convergence for this? Well, uh, since this is just a neat rate, this is the power method. So it's the, the, the vector will converge to the dominant eigenvector, and the rate of convergence will be given by the spectral gap. So which is the which is essentially the, the distance between the first and the second uh, eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay, so one would need to figure out what uh, what the second eigen eigen vector uh, eigen value of of this thing transformation is depending on the the size of, uh, depending on these two graphs. But that's that's what it is, right? So it's the second eigen vector uh, eigen value that will dictate the speed of convergence. In practice, uh, after just a few iterations, we we converge. That's that's what we've observed in practice. But Any more questions? Yes? Um, how do you describe, or can you describe a scenario where the similarity is perfect between two nodes? Because you had an example where you had the similarity of the nodes in a graph with themselves. And yes. I didn't see any ones in that matrix. There was like 0 0.40 something. You had a, okay. you had a similarity matrix uh, that was Oh, gosh, it's really, it's, it's really long. Yeah, I can't remember exactly. So your question is, uh, da, 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 for the Yeah, that one. Yeah, why don't I see ones in that? What, what is the perfect similarity? I mean, why oh, the perfect similarity. Well, this is just a matter of, yeah, okay. So you're asking why, why don't I, ha do I have a one here? Yes, okay, so, yes, it's a good point. So we've normalized, we, we, we compute the similarity only uh, to be compared one to each other. So it's, it's only the relative values of these entries that have to be considered. And so th here we've taken the normalization where the sum of the squares of all values sum up to one. But we could have normalized in a different way and we would have had ones everywhere. Okay, so this is just the fact that, yeah. I suppose how many values do we have? Uh, we have six. So if you take uh, the square of this, it could be w one over six. Yeah, so it's just uh, the scaling. Uh, but, but of course, similarity, uh, and the, the similarities coefficient that enter here should only be considered relative to each other. It's not uh, never an absolute uh, notion of similarity. Yes. Um, each one of those uh, power updates only give you either like one column or one row. This is a similarity. Uh, no, uh, what are you saying that each of these iterates gives only one column or one row? No, this is, this is the full, this S matrix has as many rows as there are nodes in the first graph and as many columns as there are nodes in the second graph. And so every iteration just updates, typically updates all the entries of the matrix. It's a complete update of, of the entire matrix. It's not just one column. But maybe I didn't get your question correctly. Oh, I guess that's the same thing. essentially uh, Yes? So this is finding similarities of individual nodes. Did you look at extending it to sort of finding the best match for the entire graph? Uh, so like if you flip back to the, the slide you were on before. Yes. Um, well, the, the one that had the the sort of the small simple graphs is what? Right. So like how would you find the best match for all of graph A and graph B rather than the best match for a given single node? Yes, yeah, okay. so they, they are, that's a good question, good question too, right? So whether, how, how can we find a match of this into, into a large graph like, like that, for example, right? So they, there are intrinsic limitation of what can be possibly be done because if, if you're given a, a graph here which is isomorphic, to another graph there, so they just it's just a renumbering of the nodes, then a perfect matching is possible. Right. But uh, deciding graph isomorphism is a problem for which there is no known polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so uh, there is no way we, we, we going with a, such a simple technique uh, 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 solve the, the, the graph isomorphism problem. Okay, so it can only be approx up, up to uh, some approximation, yes. It, we, we, we're not going to solve that, that, that exact matching problem. But, but it will, uh, so typically if you, if you take a graph here 
and then you, you, you start with a little graph here and then you sort of build a large graph around that one and then you look, look at the similarity matrix, I expect that, the, that, you'll, yeah, that you'll find the coefficients and by looking at the coefficient in the matrix, I expect that you'll be able to, to rediscover this little graph in the large graph you've constructed. But, but, but not in a completely systematic way because that would be graph isomorphism. Yes. Uh, node four in the small graph looks like a hub, two, two, two things going out of it. It looks similar to node two in the larger graph. Yes. Uh, and yet, the yeah. graph doesn't show that at all. Yes, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect. And uh, uh, of course, the example I've taken, I've tried to take the good examples on, on this matrix, right? But, you, but whatever you come up with, uh, the, the notion of similarity is not a mathematical notion unless you define it very precisely. And so people have different notions of similarity. And for example, for you, it, it's, it would mean, it would sound like, and maybe for most of you, it would sound like you'd like to have a high similarity between four and two. Right, so which means taking four and two, and in fact it's not that bad because this quantity you should you should look in this in this corresponding column, right? So it's excuse me, oh it's this one here. Yeah, it's not it's not the best you can do. It's the third it's the third value. There, there are zeros there, but but whatever you come with, uh, if if I was to come with another similarity uh, measure you'd be unsatisfied by, by some other relation, probably. And so uh, I, I'm not saying this, this notion is perfect, but it expresses some of the similarities between, between these graphs. If, if what you have in mind is uh, counting the number of outgoing, uh, outgoing edges and incoming edges, then of course uh, all of this can, can be thrown away, right? That's not what we have in mind. And, and probably then, then a, a very simple algorithm is possible if it's just a matter of counting uh, whether they have identical number of incoming and outgoing edges. This captures something different. This captures something different. And follow-up from Nitoshka, uh, you said that the uh, application, but it's not a, there are other notions of similarities and this is just one of them, which is easy to compute and uh, uh, yeah, inexpensive to compute. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you for